Hello, I'm Robert Griffin, the Executive Minister here at the Sunshine Cathedral in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I want to thank you for joining us for worship via the internet today. And if you are ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, let me personally invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We also invite you to join us on our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter. But for this moment, let's go inside and see what exciting worship opportunity lay in store for us. First reading is from the wisdom of E.E. E. Cummings. I thank you, God, for this most amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees, and for the blue dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is from the wisdom of Linda Ronstadt. When the night wind starts to sing a lonesome lullaby, it helps to think we're sleeping underneath the same big sky. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our third reading is a reading from the Psalter. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. Yet there is no actual speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not audible. Still, their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a couple getting married from their wedding canopy. And like an athlete, it runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Uh, I want to just sort of think out loud. Oh God, he's not even looking at his notes. I just want to think out loud though for a second and, uh, and, just, be, and just be serious. There is some serious uh, stuff that I think deserves our attention. And I can't tell you what to think about some of these things. I can't tell you what to believe about some of these things. But I can beg you to be mindful of these things and to think about them and to offer compassion uh, and to summon hope and to hold some of these things in your prayers. Because sometimes we just want to forget. We just get tired. Don't we get tired? Don't we get tired of always having to work for something or struggle for something or fight for something or wait for something or negotiate for something? Isn't it exhausting? And yet, that's the way it is in this world. That's the way it is in this life. There's always something to do. The, we want to talk about the church triumphant, but the church triumphant is the church that never rests. 
And so to experience these triumphs in life, we have to be attentive. We have to be vigilant. We have to be aware. We have to be conscious. And we have to be indefatigable. We have to always be working and aware and moving forward. And so I want to just call to your mind today. I know that sometimes people say, well, I don't want to hear about politics, and I don't want to hear about tragedy, and I don't want to hear about trouble, and I don't want to hear about economics, and I don't want to hear about sex, and I don't want to hear about social problems. Well, why would you get out of bed? What are we going to talk about, for heaven's sakes? <laughs> you know, it's life. It's what's going on in the world. And so, so I just want you to be mindful of the people in Chile today. I just want you to be aware that there is human suffering. We don't have the answer for it. We don't have the, uh, uh, we, we can't solve all of it, but we can care. And it is indecent not to care. And so let's be mindful of the people of Chile today. And let's be mindful that in the United States, the lower house of our bicameral uh, legislature has voted to defund Planned Parenthood. And I hope that the Senate uh, doesn't, uh, d doesn't uh, support that. And if they do, I'm pretty certain the president will veto it. And if he does, I hope the Senate can't override the veto. But what I do know is that if it is defunded for a year, that in that year, women will die. Women will die who did not have to die. And I realize it's a complicated issue and we have all kinds of feelings about it, but surely we can support women to make their own health decisions and to say, whenever life begins, we see your life here now and we don't want it to end before it needs to. And so I stand with Planned Parenthood and with women. <laughs> And if there are women who disagree, let them have that debate. But I am sick to death of men colonizing women's bodies. Yes. And our country's getting a visit by the Pope. And that is historic, and that is wonderful, and that's full of regality and, 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 uh, and, and pomp and circumstance, and it's a good thing. And the president has invited faith leaders to greet him, to offer hospitality, just to say hello, we're glad you're here. And some of those faith leaders are gay and lesbian. Guess what? There are 10,000 people on the list. A thousand of them are going to be queer. I just promise. <laughs> Half a dozen of them are telling the truth about it. And there is such a brouhaha amongst our far-right evangelical conservative and fundamentalist friends because the president has dared to acknowledge that gay people of faith exist and Mike could offer the gift of hospitality to the Pope. And so I just want us to be mindful of that. I just want us to be mindful that someone in our congregation died recently and and others are actually fighting for their life. I want us to be mindful that climate change is real and it is impacting lives on this planet. I want us to be mindful that there are countries where you and I could be imprisoned or executed or killed without any, without, uh, any consequence just for who we are and who we love. And I want you to be aware that there are people in this country who think that's the way it ought to be and are very angry that it's not that way here. I don't have the answer to fix that, but it will never get better if we don't remember. I want us to be aware that people are fleeing Syria for their lives, often with no guaranteed place to go. And the people who are opening their doors to them don't really always have means to accommodate them, but are trying anyway because it's the human thing to do. I want us to be aware 
that we are choosing leaders. We are always choosing leaders. Uh, the House of Representatives every two years, uh, a third of the Senate every two years, the President every four years, governors, mayors. We are constantly choosing leaders in this, in this democracy. And as people ask to be our leaders, they are increasingly and unashamedly attacking people for who they love, for the gender that they identify as, and for the, the color of their skins. Make no mistake, this anti-Muslim rhetoric we hear increasingly and so shamelessly is actually anti-brown rhetoric. And we have to call it out and stand against it. And so I want us to be mindful and I want us to care, and I want us to say, sometimes I don't have the answer, sometimes I don't even know what side of the issue I stand on, but I care. I was talking to a staff member just between services, and we were saying, we, we don't know what the answer to this particular thing is, but it is heartbreaking, and it is inhuman not to at least knowledge, acknowledge the heartbreaking nature of a situation. But I've got an important message for you today. I don't have the answers, I don't have quick fixes, but I do have a message. And sometimes people will say, why are we always talking about how good we innately are? Why are we always talking about the goodness of diversity? Why are we always talking about the power and necessity of hope? Why are we always talking about trying to make things better? Why can't we just celebrate the status quo? Because the status quo is antithetical to the kingdom of God. And so if we are going to call ourselves Christian or religious at all, if we were going to call ourselves Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist, then our calling is to live out our faith in a way that uplifts everyone and makes the world a more peaceful, more generous, safer, more just place for all people. And so I have a message today. It's a message you've heard before. It's a message that some people say we have, we have uh, ridden till the wheels have fallen off. But I promise you that if the wheels fall off, we'll just put new ones on because the message is still needed. I remain passionate about this message and I will be dedicated to this message for the rest of my life. But lest you think that everything is political and global and, and, and requires analysis, I know that things are closer to home. I know that there are other things you also care about. I know that some of us have had financial challenges lately. I know that some of us have had health concerns. I know some of us have lost loved ones. I know some of us have been hurt by people who say terribly demeaning things in the name of religion. Even as marriage equality has become the law of the land, there are entire churches and public figures and political candidates who insist on dehumanizing and demonizing same gender loving people and in some circles their abuse is actually escalating. We have to speak out against that. We have to at least acknowledge that it's there and offer a counter narrative. Whether your identity or your love or your loved ones or your body or your finances have seemed to be the target of mischievous forces lately, I want to offer you a word of encouragement that you can take with you through every challenge in life. A word of encouragement that can help you heal from all manner of hurts. And then, having applied it to your life, I want you to share that encouragement with others. One person at a time, we can change the world. If you were following our, our adventures on Facebook, you know that in the midst of, of kidney stones and, and, and blarney stones, in the, midst, <laughs> in the midst of all kinds of adventures, that we also made personal connections with a wonderful couple, an Orthodox Jewish couple from Philadelphia, with an entire group of church ladies from, uh, from uh, Ohio, and with a couple of Southern Bells, natives of Mississippi, uh, one of whom now lives in Alabama, the other who splits her time between Mississippi and Pennsylvania. And we got to really spend, because we, we did what Jesus did, we spent table fellowship with strangers. And over the course of two weeks, Southern Baptist women from the Deep South became friends and allies. 
and started, and started making overt gestures of support. And at the end, these Caucasian, Southern, evangelical, Protestant, affluent women said to the biracial queer couple, thank you for being so sweet to us. We forget that we have the power to touch people just by being present to them. And so, yes, we have to encourage ourselves so that we have encouragement to give others. Please don't grow weary of well-doing, as the Bible says. It is our calling, it is our mission, it is our purpose to tell our story, to speak truth to power, to offer hope to the hopeless, and to say over and over and over again, no matter who you are, you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. I'm going to start preaching now. <laughs> In ancient agrarian cultures, nature was seen as divine. All of nature, everything in it. And humanity was included in that picture. And there was, in these ancient agrarian cultures, there was always a sky god known by different names depending on the culture or tribe. He was often associated with the sun or wind or thunder. And the sky god was always a very manly god. He was a warrior. He had breastplates and, and hammers and spears and shields. And, you know, he was that kind of a dude. So, you know, at the end of a long day of, of wielding lightning and blowing winds and defeating foes and, and all of that stuff that, that, that manly gods do, well, you know, a Viking sort of god or, or a, a, a tribal sort of god likes some good loving. And so the, the sky god was usually depicted as the mate or the spouse or the lover of the earth goddess. See? Religion is sexy. And so <laughs> the Sumerian sky god was Anu and his earth missus was Kai. In Greek mythology, Uranus was the sky god until he retired because people were so mean about his name. But Uranus was the sky god and Gaia was the earth mother. In South America, Pachamama was the earth goddess and her divine husband was Pachacamac. In the Norse pantheon, Thor was the god of sky and thunder and storms and his earth goddess consort was Sif, known for her amazing gold hair. Well, something should come of a good romance, right? Romance should be empowering, and it should erupt with joy and bless others. It should seek good for the all, not just the few. And so when lovers find each other and they find happiness together, they want everyone to be happy. And so it is in these ancient imaginings of gods and goddesses and the love they shared with one another, the world actually benefited as well. Sky gods and earth goddesses, like human lovers, would make whoopee. And that was good for everybody. Now, the sky god and the earth goddess, they would make whoopee, and you knew when they did it. They weren't shy about it. They let you know, because whenever the earth, sky god and the earth goddess made whoopee, it would rain. It would rain. The weather girls wrote a hymn about that. <laughs> And the rain was the sky god's climactic moment. After the rain came the cosmic cigarette. <laughs> the rain was the sky god's seminal fluid impregnating the earth goddess. And months later, her children would be born, the crops that sustained animal and human life. So all life was basically the children of the gods, those heavenly and earthy lovers who influenced the elements and gave life to the earth and all its inhabitants. Those ancient myths showed the divine to be both father and mother, both powerful and loving, both transcendent and eminent, both cosmic and earthy, and we do well to keep that balance in our imaginings of the divine today. Even though our understanding of life and science is far more sophisticated, if less creative and poetic, than our ancestors, we still tend to marvel at nature, and particularly the sky. You'll hear a lot of songs about the sky today, 
and the readings today were about the sky. We get excited about the sky. We get excited about eclipses. We get excited about, uh, uh, about nature and, and, and weather acts. We uh, call those who excel, excel in their fields, we call them stars. And when someone is always happy, we call them sunny. Maybe we call them annoying, but we also say they have a sunny disposition. And those who are always down and depressed and melancholy, we say they're under a dark cloud. We sometimes will wish on a star or stare at the moon and contemplate. And when, this, when, when uh, we're feeling very good, we say we, can, we feel like we can fly. And when we're overwhelmed, we think the sky is falling. And when the sun is out and the sky is clear like it is today, we universally declare that it's a beautiful day. The magic of the sky resides in our speech and in our thinking, even in the 21st century. In our scriptures, there is plenty of sky imagery to inspire and encourage us. The oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, presents the character Job as suffering from a series of misfortunes, and when he can't take it anymore, and he rages at God for how unfair life is, God visits him as a tornado. The writer of Deuteronomy describes the Israelites' journey toward the promised land as God leading them like a mother eagle teaches her eaglets to fly. Elijah escaped death by being taken to a cosmic paradise in a whirlwind, in a storm, in, in, in a tornado. The prophet Ezekiel imagined God being like a rainbow in the sky after the rain. The Persian magi followed signs in the sky to discover the Christ child. The gospel writers imagine God being present at Jesus' baptism as a dove hovering in the sky. And Jesus prayed, our God, Abba, our parent, which art in heaven. And heaven is the skies, or more literally, in the Aramaic, it would have been something like God who fills the entire universe. No wonder the psalmist declared in the reading we heard this morning, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. In the heavens, God has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a couple getting married from their wedding canopy. And like an athlete, it runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And nothing is hid from its heat. The writer seems to believe that the earth and the sky is flat and that, the, and that the sun travels through it, but even if he got the cosmology wrong, he knows that by looking to nature, and particularly the sky, we can be filled with wonder and gratitude and hope. And when we summon those sacred emotions, those feelings, we can do incredible things in our lives and for our world. Gratitude, wonder, hope, that is the ingredients of a miracle. We communicate through the air. The, our, my speech right now is, is coming to you through the air. We communicate by means of radio and television and internet and cell phones. We travel through the air on airplanes. We have learned the laws of physics and how to cooperate with them and how to achieve what our ancestors would have called magic or miracles. But still, the sky, the air, the universe calls out to us to explore possibilities and discover new wonders. Astronomers and astrophysicists study the heavens, the sky. Meteorologists forewarn us about winds and rains. Television and movie screens feature modern myths of space travel and cosmic exploration. The sky continues to inspire us, and there's a reason why. We don't have to be engineers or astronauts or pilots to answer the call to explore possibilities. We can do that right in our own lives. The sky and literature about nature in the sky inspire us and remind us that life is filled with possibilities and wonderful opportunities and grace equal to every need. Yes, things are difficult. Yes, people get sick. Yes, the weather seems to betray us sometimes. Yes, economies fail. Yes, people have to leave their countries to be safe sometimes. Yes, there are those who are always promoting their bigotry and their prejudice and, and sometimes trying to call it religion. Yes, there are always things going on, and yet we can explore our own value, our own worth, and we can share with others who have been hurt or wounded or marginalized or excluded and let them know there is more to the story than they've heard so far. We 
are part of this nature that is grand and glorious and that inspires poetry and songs and mythology. Carl Sagan said, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. Stars that imploded and exploded and died billions of years ago are still with us and in us. The life of a star is forever. Even when the light goes out, even when it doesn't look like a star anymore, it's still part of the all in all. It is still part of all that is. Those particles are in the room. Those particles are in our bodies. There are echoes of the Big Bang in this room. So we know that the story is ongoing. Whatever we're facing right now, that is just an experience and there's more on the other side of it. It's always too soon to give up hope because there's always more to the story. Just like stars from billions of years ago are in the room with us today, we are also forever. And if we are forever, then it's always too soon to give up hope. We are part of all that is, all that ever has been, and all that ever will be. How empowering is that realization. Of course the heavens inspire us. We're part of them. We're made from the magic of the universe itself. In our own biblical creation myth, the creator says, let us make humanity in our own image. Who is this us? Who is the creator talking to in that parable? Does the creator have a partner? Well, sort of. Because earlier in that story, the creator has made the earth, and then everything in the earth, the plants, the animals, the vegetation, the waters, and then finally, human life. And so the creator is saying to the rest of creation, let us, divine and mortal, heavenly and earthly, spiritual and physical, let us create humanity like us, animal, elemental, divine, mortal, eternal, fragile, resilient. Evolution shows that we are connected to other species. Theoretical physics shows that we are made from star stuff. Religion tells us we are the children of God. All of this is contained in the phrase, let us make people in our own image. And that's what has happened. The sky inspires us because it reminds us of who we are. We are thunder and starlight, sun rays and moonbeams, wind and rain, dust and spirit. We are God's life in human form. And so when we say, God bless this person and God help that person and God be with that person, we must remember that what God does for us, God does through us. Our hands are God's hands and we should never really pray a prayer that we're not willing to be the answer to. That's our message at the Sunshine Cathedral, that we are divine life in expression. We glean it from song and poem, from film and dance, from philosophy and psychology, from science and sacred story, from every possible source. The one message continues to come to us and through us and from us, and that message is you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. You're made from star stuff. You are a product of the Big Bang. You are made from the love that God is. You are part of the first breath ever drawn. You are dust and you are magic. You are light and you are solid, you are water, you are memory, you are imagination, you are everything condensed into a physical manifestation. You are a miracle. Franklin Graham may not see it. Pope Benedict may not see it. Lots of your parents may not have seen it. Political candidates may not see that, but that's for them to learn and grow through. You get to know here and today that you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. You are part of the creation that is very good. Your love is holy. You are a sacred being. You are a product of sky divinity and earth divinity making mad passionate love and you are the result. And since God is your substance, you cannot be without hope. Since God is your substance, you cannot be without purpose. Since God is your substance, it doesn't matter what any 
ideology, philosophy, or text says, you get to know yourself as part of the one power, the one life, the all in all. Since God is your substance, you are never without recourse to joy. Since God is your substance, God is your life, God is your strength, God is your comfort, God is your source of supply, God is the presence of love within you, and God will never and can never let you go. You don't have to repent of who you are, you are meant to embrace Embrace who you are, to celebrate who you are, to say right now to the God of your understanding, God, Goddess, the great unknown, whatever you call the all in all, thank you that I am what I am. Thank you for my life as it is. Thank you that I am a miracle and not a mistake. God will never and can never let you go. That's the word of encouragement that I want to give you today. That's the word of encouragement that I want to give you for the rest of my life. That is the word of encouragement that I want to keep in you to keep in your hearts at all times. Because this word of encouragement is actually the good news. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.